How I Came to Play Rip Van Winkle by Joseph Jefferson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The hope of entering the race for dramatic fame as an individual and single attraction never came into my head until, in 1858, I acted Asa Trenchard in Our American Cousin. But as the curtain descended on the first night of that remarkably successful play, visions of large type, foreign countries, and increased remuneration floated before me, and I resolved to be a star, if I could. A resolution to this effect is easily made. Its accomplishment is quite another matter. Art has always been my sweetheart, and I have loved her for herself alone. I had fancied that our affection was mutual, so that when I failed as a star, which I certainly did, I thought she had jilted me. And not so. I wronged her. She only reminded me that I had taken too great a liberty, and that if I expected to win her I must press my suit with more patience. Checked, but undaunted in the resolve, my mind dwelt upon my vision, and I still indulged in daydreams of the future. During these delightful reveries it came upon me that in acting Asa Trenchard I had, for the first time in my life, on the stage spoken a pathetic speech, and though I did not look at the audience during the time I was acting, for that is dreadful, I felt that they both laughed and cried. I had before this often made my audience smile, but never until now had I moved them to tears. This to me novel accomplishment was delightful and in casting about for a new character my mind was ever dwelling on reproducing an effect where humour would be so closely allied to pathos that smiles and tears should mingle with each other. Where could I get one? There had been many written, and as I looked back into the dramatic history of the past, a long line of lovely ghosts loomed up before me, passing as in a procession. Job Thornberry, Bob Tyke, Frank Ostland, Ezekiel homespun, and a host of departed heroes, with martial stock went by my watch. Charming fellows all, but not for me. I felt I could not do them justice. Besides, they were too human. I was looking for a myth, something intangible and impossible, but he would not come. Time went on, and still with no result. During the summer of 1859 I arranged to board with my family at a queer old Dutch farmhouse in Paradise Valley at the foot of the Pocono Mountain in Pennsylvania. A ridge of hills covered with tall hemlocks surrounds the vale, and numerous trout streams wind through the meadows and tumble over the rocks. Stray farms are scattered through the valley, and the few old Dutchmen and their families who till the soil were born upon it. There, and only there, they have ever lived." The valley harmonized with me and our resources. The scene was wild, the air was fresh, and the board was cheap. What could the light heart and purse of a poor actor ask for more than this? On one of those long rainy days that always rendered the country so dull, I had climbed to the loft of the barn, and lying upon the hay was reading that delightful book, The Life and Letters of Washington Irving. I had gotten well into the volume, and was much interested in it, when, to my surprise, I came upon a passage which said that he had seen me at Laura Keene's theatre as Goldfinch in Holcroft's comedy The Road to Ruin, and that I reminded him of my father, in look, gesture, size, and make. Till then I was not aware that he had ever seen me. I was comparatively obscure and to find myself remembered and written of by such a man gave me a thrill of pleasure I can never forget. I put down the book, and lay there thinking how proud I was, and ought to be, at the revelation of this compliment. What an incentive to a youngster like me to go on! And so I thought to myself, Washington Irving, the author of the sketchbook, in which is the quaint story of Rip Van Winkle, Rip Van Winkle. There was to me magic in the sound of the name as I repeated it. Why was this not the very character I wanted? An American story by an American author was surely just the theme suited to an American actor. 
In ten minutes I had gone to the house and returned to the barn with the sketchbook. I had not read the story since I was a boy. I was disappointed with it. Not as a story, of course, but the tale was purely a narrative. The theme was interesting, but not dramatic. The silver Hudson stretches out before you as you read. The quaint red roofs and queer gables of the old Dutch cottages stand out against the mist upon the mountains. But all this is descriptive. The character of Rip does not speak ten lines. What could be done dramatically with so simple a sketch? How could it be turned into an effective play? Three or four bad dramatizations of the story had already been acted, but without marked success. Yates of London had given one in which the hero dies. One had been acted by my father, one by Hackett, and another by Burke. Some of these versions I had remembered when I was a boy, and I should say that Burke's play and performance were the best, but nothing that I remembered gave me the slightest encouragement that I could get a good play out of any of the existing materials. Still I was so bent upon acting the part that I started for the city, and in less than a week, by industriously ransacking the theatrical wardrobe establishments for old leather and mildewed cloth, and by personally superintending the making of the wigs, each article of my costume was completed. And all this, too, before I had written a line of the play, or studied a word of the part. This is working in an opposite direction from all the conventional methods in the study and elaboration of a dramatic character, and certainly not following the course I would advise anyone to pursue. I merely mention the out-of-the-way, upside-down manner of going to work as an illustration of the impatience and enthusiasm with which I entered upon the task. I can only account for my getting the dress ready before I studied the part to the vain desire I had of witnessing myself in the glass, decked out and equipped as the hero of the Catskills. I got together the three old printed versions of the drama and the story itself. The plays were all in two acts. I thought it would be an improvement in the drama to arrange it in three, making the scene with the Spectre crew an act by itself. This would separate the poetical from the domestic side of the story. But by far the most important alteration was in the interview with the spirits. In the old versions they spoke and sang. I remembered that the effect of this ghostly dialogue was dreadfully human, so I arranged that no voice but Rip's should be heard. This is the only act on the stage in which but one person speaks while all the others merely gesticulate, and I was quite sure that the silence of the crew would give a lonely and desolate character to the scene and add to its supernatural weirdness. By this time, too, a strong contrast with the single voice of Rip was obtained by the death-like stillness of the demons as they glided about the stage in solemn silence. It required some thought to hit upon just the best questions that could be answered by a nod and shake of the head, and to arrange that at times even Rip should propound a query to himself and answer it but I had availed myself of so much of the old material that in a few days after I had begun my work it was finished. In the seclusion of the barn I studied and rehearsed the part, and by the end of summer I was prepared to transplant it from the rustic realms of an old farmhouse to a cosmopolitan audience in the city of Washington, where I opened at Carusi's Hall under the management of John T. Raymond. I had gone over the play so thoroughly that each situation was fairly engraved on my mind. The rehearsals were therefore not tedious to the actors. No one was delayed that I might consider how he or she should be disposed in the scene. I had by repeated experiments so saturated myself with the action of the play that a few days seemed to perfect the rehearsals. I acted on these occasions with all the point and feeling that I could muster. This answered the double purpose of giving me freedom and of observing the effect of what I was doing on the actors. They seemed to be watching me closely, and I could tell by little nods of approval where and when the points hit. I became each day more and more interested in the work. There was in the subject and the part much scope for novel and fanciful treatment. If the sleep of twenty years was merely incongruous, there would be room for argument, pro and con. But as it is an impossibility, I felt that the audience would accept it at once, not because it was an impossibility but from a desire to know in what condition a man's mind would be if such an event could happen. Would he be thus changed? 
his identity being denied both by strangers friends and family would he at last almost accept the verdict and exclaim then i am dead and that is a fact this was a strange and original attitude of the character that attracted me in acting such a part what to do was simple enough but what not to do was the important and difficult point to determine as the earlier scenes of the play were of a natural and domestic character i had only to draw upon my experience for their effect or employ such conventional methods as myself and others had used before in characters of that ilk but from the moment rip meets the spirits of hendrick hudson and his crew i felt that all colloquial dialogue and commonplace pantomime should cease it is at this point in the story that the supernatural element begins and henceforth the character must be raised from the domestic plane and lifted into the realms of the ideal to be brief the play was acted with a result that was to me both satisfactory and disappointing i was quite sure that the character was what i had been seeking and i was equally satisfied that the play was not the action had neither the body nor the strength to carry the hero the spiritual quality was there but the human interest was wanting the final alterations and additions were made five years later by dion Boussacault. rip van winkle was not a sudden success it did not burst upon the public like a torrent its flow was gradual and its source sprang from the Hartz Mountains, an old German legend called Carl the Shepherd, being the name of the original story. The genius of Washington Irving transplanted the tale to our own Catskills. The grace with which he paints the scene, and still more the quaintness of the story, placed it far above the original. Yeats, Hackett, and Burke had separate dramas written upon this scene, and acted the hero, leaving their traditions one to the other i now came forth and saying give me leave set to work using some of the before-mentioned traditions mark you added to this diane boussacolt brought his dramatic skill to bear and by important additions made a better play and a more interesting character of the hero than had as yet been reached this adaptation in my turn i interpreted and enlarged upon it is thus evident that while i may have done much to render the character and the play popular it has not been the work of one mind but both as to its narrative and its dramatic form has been often moulded and by many skilful hands so it would seem that those dramatic successes that come like shadows so depart and those that are lasting have ability for their foundation and industry for their superstructure i speak now of the former and the present condition of the drama what the future may bring forth it is difficult to determine the histrionic kaleidoscope revolves more rapidly than of yore and the fantastic shapes that it exhibits are brilliant and confusing but under all circumstances i should be loath to believe that any conditions will render the appearance of frivolous novices more potent than the earnest design of legitimate professors End of How I Came to Play Rip Van Winkle by Joseph Jefferson